Welcome to Monday Night Live from Inside ND Sports. This is our weekly YouTube show, somewhat still new, uh, from the staff at Inside ND Sports and the Rivals Network. I'm Eric Hansen. He's Tyler James. Kyle Kelly, our recruiting writer, is working on some feature stories on recruits from the state of North Carolina, who he interviewed while on the recent road trip. But tonight, Tyler and I will break down the Notre, uh, Notre Dame's 45-32 trampling of North Carolina and spin it forward into what it means into the big picture of the season. We'll also take your questions towards the end of the show. Uh, typically, Marcus Freeman holds a weekly press conference Monday at Notre Dame Stadium. That didn't happen. Uh, so we, instead of turning to Tyler, we're going to jump right into the uh the review of the game, the 45-32 victory at Keenan Stadium in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and do away with the headlines. So <laughs> on to the review of that. So Notre Dame on Saturday defeated North Carolina 45-32. Some of the team uh, superlatives, the Irish outrushed North Carolina, which was the 13th best rushing team in the country. 287 to 66. They racked up 567 total yards, which is tied for the 10th most since 2010. In terms of playing keep away from the North Carolina offense, they did that well with 85 offensive plays themselves and 60 for the Tar Heels. Um, the time of possession reflected that 38 minutes and 13 seconds for Notre Dame, 2147 for North Carolina. And 35 first downs Notre Dame racked up is the most since a school record 36 and a win over Army in 1974. We've got lots of individual things we'll get to. But, uh, Tyler, first of all, uh, what's your kind of overall impression, overall takeaway from a team standpoint from the North Carolina victory? Yeah, I, I thought it was – as good of a performance as you could have expected from Notre Dame. I, I think the offense really played well. It, it, it took a little bit of time to get started in the game, but once things got it clicking, it was um, practically unstoppable for North Carolina's defense. And uh, I thought Drew Pine played pretty well. Um, the The stat that stood out to me was that he was five of nine for 123 yards and two touchdowns on throws, 10 plus yards downfield. I think uh, that's something that Notre Dame needs to do in the offense. You would certainly like to see more of those potentially beyond 20 yards downfield. Uh, Pine was only one of three with a 30-yard touchdown to Lorenzo Styles on passes 20-plus yards downfield. But you could, could sort of see like Notre Dame would like certainly to be able to add that to the offense, but it can certainly be um, successful, dynamic, without trying to throw bombs all the time. It's not necessarily something that is the strength of Drew Pine nor the strength of Notre Dame's wide receiver core at this point. So the fact that they were still able to sort of score at will against North Carolina without that being a, a significant part of the offense was 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 crucial. And, and the defense sort of keeping um, North Carolina in check after maybe a little bit of a shaky start um, and dealing with some injuries and uh, keeping Drake May at bay because that was, that was going to be a tough task. Not many teams have been able to do it, or no team really had been able to do it um, to the extent that that Notre Dame did for much of the game, although um, North Carolina certainly added some some garbage time stats in the second half. Right, and speaking of those garbage time stats, you know, that game could have easily been 52-26. to 26. Audric Estime goes to kind of twist and kind of reaches the ball toward the goal line and fumbles it at the goal line. North Carolina recovers in the end zone for a touchback and then nine pull, nine snaps later, a couple of penalties in there, uh, a 64 yard pass on fourth and 20 something uh, for a touchdown. So it got a little sloppy at the end. Uh, I think if you're an AP voter and not saying Notre Dame deserves to be ranked, but if you're somebody kind of watching and didn't watch the game, but just kind of scoreboard watching 52, 26 looks a lot more convincing than 45-32, but it still was a convincing victory as far as I'm I'm concerned. Um, let's go back to Drew Pine a little bit. 
did what he what he was able to do in this game, and he was 24 of 34 for 289 yards and three touchdowns. Did that change the way you look at Drew Pine moving forward? Or do you think, okay, this was a nice incremental step. I need to see more before I I change my trajectory of what this team's capable of? Um, I don't know that I, I would say it changed my mind. It, it, I, I mean, it look, looked more like what I thought he was capable of. I, I didn't think that Drew Pine was the Drew Pine that showed up at the beginning of the Cal game or even at the end of the Marshall game. I thought that there was some ability there. Um, there was some precision and proficiency within the offense that could be built around him. And I think he showed that uh, on Saturday. Now, certainly it's one thing for me to think it. It's another thing for him to do it with, with a consistency. And that's something that he can only answer in terms of being able to do that repeatedly throughout the rest of the season. But there weren't, there weren't a lot of things that he did against North Carolina that seemed like, Oh, there's no way he's going to be able to get away with that all the time. I think certainly there were, there were some tight window throws and I think, Michael Mayer isn't always going to be able to work himself open, um, but I, I I think you're going to bet on Michael Mayer more more times than you're not. Um, the running backs probably aren't going to be left wide open as much as they were at times against North Carolina, but Drew Pine being able to recognize that and not missing that is a big part of those plays being able to work. So I, I think certainly a lot of it has to do with the quality of North Carolina's defense. But I think what we saw from Drew Pine was something that he could continue to do throughout the season. And I think, although I said like it didn't necessarily change a lot of what I thought, it certainly it helps to see that and having some confidence that he can do that throughout. Now, he, like I said, he still has to keep doing that. So um, we, we can't say f- with certainty that that's, this, this is what it's going to look like a month from now. But the, the possibilities of this offense may make a lot more sense when Drew Pine plays that way. And, and I, I think he can continue to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, he knew what to do in the post game press conference. He gushed over the offensive line <laughs> and Tommy Reese's play calling. So he knows where his bread is buttered. Um, he wakes up on Sunday morning with a 159.3 season pass efficiency rating, which puts him 35th in the country and uh, almost 60 spots ahead of. Phil Jakovic, for those who like to play that game of the what if game, if and Phil's in a completely different situation at Boston College, um, with a, one of the worst offensive lines in the country, given the health of that offensive line and absolutely no running game to go with him. I think anybody would be struggling there, but those like who like to compare, that's what it looks like. It's also an interesting number because if it stayed at that point to the end of the season it would be the highest pass efficiency rating for a Notre Dame quarterback, starting quarterback at the end of the season since Jimmy Clausen in 2009 was just over 161 points. And to show you how much uh, the passing game has evolved the last few years, in 2009, that 161 was third in the country. Hmm. Uh, The the winning... um, was Tim Tebow, the winning pass efficiency rating. He was 164 plus. And so now that would put you in the thirties in this day and age. There's, there's, you know, the elite quarterbacks are over 200, but, but certainly this is a good start. I thought for Drew Pine and yes, North Carolina is one of the worst, not only pass defenses in the country, they're one of the worst overall defenses, but I like the game. I like the way that uh, Tommy Reese did call the game. I think uh, Drew Pine did more in my mind in terms of poise and uh, proficiency than I was expecting. So I'm eager to see how this translates after the bye week to BYU. Now, there were three running backs, Audrey Estime, Logan Diggs, and Chris Tyree that got over 100 yards from scrimmage. Uh, for the Irish. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on that and also whether you feel like a three-man rotation works for Notre Dame moving forward or do you think they're going to have to skinny that down to two with some maybe garbage time for the third guy eventually? I I think it works if you're using them as receiving threats as well. 
Um, and that seems like something that Notre Dame has interest in doing. And it's probably something that Notre Dame needs to do with the lack of wide receivers that Notre Dame trusts and has proven itself to get be able to get open when it, when needed to. Uh, so, so I, I think there, there are creative ways that Notre Dame can use all three of those running backs. Certainly when you play two running backs at a time on the field, that makes it a little bit easier as well. And Notre Dame has had quite a bit, a bit of success when it's done that this season. So I think all three of those guys played well. I think they're all, they've all, all three of them have shown that they are versatile. I, I, we, we hear a lot about that. Like obviously that's what the coaches want from them. Um, and you're going to have certain guys that are better at certain things, but all three of those guys can, can run routes, can catch the ball, um, can run up the middle, um, can bounce it to the outside. Obviously you're, you're going to like Chris Tyree trying to get around the edge more than you're going to like Audric Estime getting around the edge. You're going to like Audric Estime trying to get between the center and the guard more than you're going to like Chris Tyree trying to get between the center and the guard. But those guys are capable of doing the, all of those things to very varying levels. And I think all of those levels are, are at a high enough level that you need, that you need and can play them. So I, I think that that is something that was impressed. I don't know that I thought that that would be the case. I mean, I, I like all three of them as players, but I didn't necessarily know if that was going to be the way it would proceed now. And now maybe it won't, but I, I think that Notre Dame has put itself in a position and maybe it's, because of its lack of wide receiver talent um, to, to be able to use all three of those guys. Do you, do you share that uh, opinion, Eric? Yeah, I, I think again, as long as there isn't a full complement of wide receivers, this, this makes sense. And maybe even if there is, because uh, certainly Chris Tyree is better than some of the wide receivers at, at playing in the slot and so forth. Um you know, you're not using Estime so much in that role, although we saw in practices he's certainly capable. And then, you know, Diggs got open on the um, sideline route. So I, I don't mind it. I think, you know, it's going to be interesting in games like uh, Syracuse and Clemson when you're going against a hardier running defense, what, what that looks like. And maybe you do skinny it down in that game. And yeah, speaking of wide receivers, I mean, we still haven't seen much of Joe Wilkins. I, I think he's played maybe 13 snaps all season, and he didn't play any in this game. You know, Deion Colsey got on the field a little bit, Tobias Merriweather. So th that's three wide receivers that either barely played or didn't play at all. So th that certainly um, affects how I would look at the usage of the running backs as well. The tight ends were interesting. Um, you know, my younger sister watched the game, and she's not a Notre Dame fan, but she was uh, pretty wowed by Michael Mayer in the game, and she also thinks he's handsome. Um, <laughs> so, but he had seven catches for 88 yards and a touchdown. North Carolina really didn't have an answer for him, and I think that's what Notre Dame kind of ex Notre Dame fans kind of expect to happen every game. You know, just depending on defensive game plans, I think it's more realistic uh, some weeks than other weeks. But I thought Tommy Reese did a great job of targeting him, getting him the ball, um, getting him in the ball different ways. What I want to talk about is the other tight ends. We saw 30 reps from Eli Reardon. We saw nine reps from David Sherwood. And we saw, I think it was seven from Holden Stays, the other freshman. The reason we saw those guys was because Kevin Bauman is out for the year. With a torn ACL, he suffered in practice last week. First of all, Tyler, what's your thoughts about moving forward without Kevin Bauman? Yeah, I think it's certainly a loss. I had been disappointed with the level of play that we had seen from Kevin Bauman, particularly as a blocker. Um, and he hasn't necessarily given Notre Dame a ton in the way of, of being a receiver. So if you're not getting the job done as a blocker, then... Um, the value of playing two tight ends together diminishes. And so um, certainly you'd like for the kid to be able to stay healthy. He's had some issues with that during his career and an unfortunate injury to happen during practice and, and to lose him for the rest of the season with the ACL injury. Um, but Notre Dame has other tight ends that I think are cap capable. 
Um, and I think we saw sort of like what the answer to that looks like against North Carolina. And I think we will continue, continue to see more of that, whether it's the freshman and Eli Raritan or Holden stays Davis Sherwood has been someone that I thought we would see more of earlier in the season than we did. And now we did see more of him. And I, I liked what he brings to the offense and not necessarily a traditional tight end role, uh, more of an H back and a fullback kind of player, but someone that can create some lead blocks, which Notre Dame can, can use to enhance its running game. And then I think we're going to start to see maybe some came wrong somewhere down the line. I think he's getting healthier and in a position to be able to contribute. Uh, I don't know to what extent and how much Notre Dame um, is ready to push that yet, but I think um, that that's someone that I'm curious to see where, where he ends up after the bye week um, because I don't think he's been really available for Notre Dame to use to this point after he was recovering from his, his own knee injury last season. So I think that the the tight end position is in a good spot. I think it seems that Jared Parker has done a good job of getting Holden Says and Eli Raritan ready to be able to contribute. Certainly, we didn't see a lot of them from the jump to start the season, but I think um, we're going to see a lot more of them moving forward. Eli Raritan, even though he's not the thickest tight end, um, has held his own as, as a blocker and, and isn't afraid to get in there. I think Holden Says... For as physically impressive as Eli Raritan is, the person who stood out to me during preseason camp was Holden Stays. I was like, man, I did not think he – he looks like a college tight end already, and mm-hmm. he looked like that from the moment camp started in, in August, and I, I was a bit surprised by that. So I, I think uh, I'm intrigued by the possibilities of him as a player, um, and so I, I think there's a lot to be um, excited about in the future. Now, how how – much of an impact will they make moving forward that, that that remains to be seen, but I think there's, there's reasons to believe that there's going to be some success there. Um, it's, it's interesting with, um, with Eli, because again, really small sample size, but pro football focus. And again, it's not the end all be all. And especially in terms of grading linemen, but he has the second best run blocking grade on the team behind Joe Alt right now. And there were instances, kind of anecdotal things, where he was lined up next to Joe Alt, or I'd notice him in the game. Now, again, he was lined up next to some pretty good blockers, but you're right, he held his own in those situations. The wild card for me a little bit is Mitchell Evans, just because he's missed so much time. Marcus Freeman thought possibly the BYU game on October 8th in Las Vegas would be his return to the team from uh, an injury, a foot injury that he's uh, suffered in the summertime. And so Evans was pretty impressive last year, more so catching the ball than blocking. I think right now, you kind of mentioned this in in the breath about Bauman. You, You really want somebody that's a really good blocker, given what Notre Dame's trying to do with its running game. And there's enough of those guys that can catch balls as a third tight end or whatever. Uh, it's interesting because Eli, we thought would be kind of, at least as a freshman, maybe only able to catch balls and do it well and flex out and do all kinds of crazy things just kind of based on his high school film and and being 6'7", and we may still yet see that. Yeah, I think I'll, I think there was a thought that maybe maybe we see him as a receiver because of the lack of receiver right. depth, and now and now we're going to see plenty of him at tight end. It seems right. Um, let's flip over to the defense a little bit before we get into our in the trenches section for the offensive linemen because this was their day. Um, but on defense, it seemed like there were some really good uh, runs of 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 improved defense from Notre Dame, especially in the running game. I mean, to hold North Carolina to 66 yards, really most of those were early scrambles by um, North Carolina quarterback Drake May. When you looked at the traditional running game with the Ontario Hampton and those guys, they didn't get anything. But the alarming part was the big chunk plays North Carolina got in the passing game. Not all those were in garbage time. Um and, and I think that's where I would have some concern. So I'm curious how you saw it. Yeah, I, I'm not terribly concerned 
with especially the stuff we saw in the second half from the defense in terms of the big plays it gave up. We did see some of that in the first half too. And I, at the very start, you're like, man, if they can't keep Drake May contained, what are they going to do? And then they seem to figure that out pretty quickly. The, the running game, the success against the running game, I think some of that goes to – some of that credit goes to Notre Dame's offense for be able, being able to create a lead in the way that they did and, and I think force North Carolina to abandon the run probably sooner than it would have liked to. And I, when I do the six defining plays of the game and I was trying to find like a big run stop and there weren't really – any to pick from because there just weren't that many run attempts in, in key situations that that were worth highlighting. So I think Notre Dame really got North Carolina out of its game in, in terms of being able to run the ball and be balanced on offense. Um, and, and that helped. I think it certainly did a good job in, in stopping the run when asked to and when, when, when uh, forced to, but I think North Carolina probably abandoned the run more than it wanted to and sooner than it wanted to. And that, that helps, but the, some of the coverage mishaps, I think, I think you're going to see that against an offense that's going to take as many shots as it, as, as North Carolina does. You, you, it's just, that's, the, that's what college football looks like when you have a, a dynamic passing attack. And that's, I think that's why Notre Dame fans want to see more of that from its own offense, because you know how rewarding it can be. Even if you fail a number of times, the, the times that it does work can turn into an 80 yard touchdown. So I think that's um, just sort of a product of North Carolina continuing to s- stress the, the secondary. Um, and especially when you're, when North Carolina is playing from behind and they're throwing so often um, it's, it's, it's going to happen when there's going to be some breakdowns, there's going to be some, um, some guys getting beat in the secondary and it's worth noting that Notre Dame was missing guys from a secondary, especially in the second half playing without DJ Brown uh, starting safety. And then the number four safety, Ramon Henderson, who I think you could make an argument whether he's a three or four, but he had played the fourth most snaps at safety going into the game. Uh, he, he missed the game as well with an ankle injury. So Notre Dame certainly would like to get those guys back. Tariq Bracey was forced to play a little bit of safety, which <laughs> he's been a really great nickel cornerback. So I think you want to keep him there as much as you can. So hopefully that's ne- not necessarily a long-term solution for Notre Dame that they get those safeties back or they'll be able to rely on guys like Houston Griffith and Xavier Watts more alongside Brandon Joseph. So I, I was impressed with what Notre Dame's defense did. I, I continue to be impressed. I think they've been pretty good throughout the season. Obviously there's been a couple of drives, maybe a couple of drives per game that is like, man, what what's going on with the defense. But on the whole, I think they've been a pretty good unit. And I think, um, they're, we shouldn't necessarily overlook what they did against North Carolina just because it ended up being a bit of a high-scoring game. J.D. Bertrand at linebacker did not play in the first half because he was sitting in, out as a requirement for getting a targeting penalty in the second half against Cal the previous week. Then he gets targeting penalty number two in, in as many weeks and is was out for the rest of the – Notre Dame game against North Carolina and will not play in the first half against BYU. I want to get to the targeting penalty in a minute, but I also want to get to the guys that played a lot in the first half and I thought did a pretty good job. I thought it was Marist Leofow's best game. Marist and Jack Kaiser played most of the snaps in the first half and even a lot in the second half. Uh, Kaiser ended up being the leading tackle with nine. I think Leofow had six. And then we saw Prince Colley at linebacker for the first time this season. He got 10 snaps, which is more than Bo Bauer got. He got seven. And I like the fact that they're working Prince Colley into the game. I almost said it like Marcus. Marcus calls him Prince Colley, um, <laughs> which sounds like he's in the Aladdin movie. But um, uh, just your overall thoughts before we get to the specific targeting call of how you thought the linebackers played. Yeah, I, I thought they they played pretty well. I I felt a little a little bit like I was on a, a, an island last week and saying that I don't I don't think the linebacker play you were. has <laughs> has been as poor as it has been. Um, and I and I sort of still felt that way even as I continued to rewatch the the Cal game. I thought there was one really bad series that that Cal scored on. There was like three consecutive plays where the linebackers 
uh, played poorly, but beyond that, I think the linebacker play has 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 sort of been uh, a little bit um, the target of criticism beyond I think the 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 mishaps at that position. But but I I, I think I, I don't know that there was a lot of like stunning plays from the linebackers. Um, I, even even when JD Bertrand gets in there um, and he blitzes, he doesn't necessarily sack Drake May, but he he forced Drake May to sort of panic a little bit, and then and then he essentially fumbled the ball on his own, trying to get away from JD Bertrand. And uh, I think that sort of speaks to the way that Notre Dame is is using its linebackers creatively. I, I don't think the linebackers have have been able to get as much pressure when asked to blitz um, in certain in certain situations this season. And I think they did a little bit a better of a job of that against North Carolina. Um, I'm intrigued by the possibilities of, of Prince Kali playing some more and uh, getting in there and what the combinations are. Um, will we see more of Jack Kaiser inside moving forward, even with J.D. Bertrand playing? I, obviously, we're, gonna, we're, we're going into another game where J.D. Bertrand is going to miss the first half. So is that is that going to be more action for Jack Kaiser um, as an inside linebacker rather than a rover, because as much as Notre Dame's been playing nickel, um, that that makes some sense as long as Jack Kreiser can handle that. And I thought he did a, a pretty nice job of of doing that um, against North Carolina. What are your thoughts? You you've been more critical of the linebacker I play have. previously. So what were your thoughts? So of the people in my chat, they they we were all against you last week. So that's fine. Uh, I like not I, not I, necessarily I, by name, just in <laughs> spirit. But um, I thought. Marist finally played very fundamentally sound. I, I had asked Al Golden about him on the previous Tuesday, the Notre Dame's defensive coordinator, and he felt like Marcus just had to focus on making the bread and butter plays and the, then the explosive plays would come for him. He did have a half sack. He and Isaiah Foskey combined for one. I thought he did a nice job after some initial runs by Drake May of kind of spy playing the spy and being able to grab Drake May before he got too much yardage. Uh, I liked him in the run game uh, and uh, I like Jack Kaiser. I, I did like that combination. And I'm wondering when JD Bertrand comes back for the second half of the BYU game, if those two haven't earned more snaps than JD Bertrand. I, I, I'm there's so many things I like about JD Bertrand's game, and there's so many things that concern me, and and some of that is coverage matchups. And and as a middle linebacker, he doesn't get as many difficult ones as he did when he was a weak side linebacker last year and had to play too many snaps because of depth. So so let's get into the targeting call itself and J.D. Bertrand in the hierarchy of those linebackers. First of all, do you feel like that was a good call, that the targeting was warranted on that call? I, I did not. I haven't spent a lot of time reviewing it since uh, watching it and seeing it a number of times the the night of the game. Um, right. I don't know that I, I, I felt pretty strongly that it, that shouldn't be targeting um, Dan Orlovsky looked, did not think it was targeting the ABC. Uh, Drew, Drew Tranquil didn't either. I think he tweeted live uh, about how that J.D. Bertrand was essentially showing the fundamentals that that linebackers are taught in terms of execute, executing that the, the tackling um, of of receiving targets. So I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I know you have to be careful, but you, you have to play aggressive too. So Marcus Freeman didn't really defend J.D. Bertrand in the, in the post game. Um, I think I don't, and I don't know if that's more of just trying to avoid criticizing the officials, or um, if he felt that it was sincerely. He can get away with that since the ACC can't find him. <laughs> the 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 targeting. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I just didn't think it was targeting. I I, I think the 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 I guess the result is that you're going to just have to start going more at guys' legs, and I think that could even be more dangerous because if you get upended, then you're going to come down on your head. Uh, so I, I, I don't really know what the answer is there. I don't, I didn't have a problem with what JD Bertrand did. And, uh, I think, I think it's a concern. It's like, well, if, is, is this going to be, is this going to affect JD Bertrand moving forward? Is he going to become a worse tackler because he's afraid of targeting? Um, and that would be, um, certainly not a good thing for Notre Dame moving forward. 
before we continue, um, we're going to take questions later in the show. So put those in the how, how do you do it, Tyler? You tell them because I don't want to tell them to do submit it them in the chat box. Submit them in the chat box. You can make comments too, but we appreciate the questions even more, even if they involve some math. Yeah, so, if, you're, if you're on your desktop, the chat box should be to the right hand side. And if you're on like a mobile device, I believe it's below below our talking head. So just go ahead and type it in there and uh, we'll bring it up, put it on the screen uh, towards the end and, and give our best uh, run at, at answering them. Okay. So now we're going to move to our in the trenches section. This is our dedication to offensive line play. Why? Because we love offensive line play and we know that Notre Dame fans enjoy it too and scrutinize it. And I thought um, after a really kind of breakthrough second half against Cal, the offensive line took another step forward collectively against North Carolina. Uh, let's get your thoughts on the offensive line play, Tyler. Yeah, I thought I thought they played borderline excellent. I don't I don't know that you could expect much more from what they were able to do. Uh, against North Carolina, the group was creating big holes. I think the play calling at aided them in in trying to expose the edges of North Carolina's defense, which then made it a little bit easier to create some lanes on the interior of the defense. I thought the right side of the offensive line with right guard Josh Lug and right tackle Blake Fisher played their best game of the season. Notre Dame didn't run it to the right as much as it did to the left hand side, which is has been more successful to the left hand side. Um, throughout the season, but um, it was more efficient against North Carolina running to the right. There were three carries behind right tackle Blake Fisher for 34 yards, one carry behind right guard Josh Lug for 11 yards, and then eight carries for 67 yards between Zeke Carell at center and, and Lug. So that's not to say that the left side of the def- offensive line didn't play well. Joe Alt is continuing to play at a high level. He's, he's so technically sound, um, and that really shows up when he's playing at his best. I don't know that I would call him a physically dominant player, but he's someone who, because he's so sound with his technique and the attention to detail, he allows himself to play that way, even though he may not just be manhandling people. It sort of comes off that way just because he plays in such a way that um, prevents defensive linemen from from countering what he's doing. So um, I think we've seen why Notre Dame has so high expectations for him. And the ceiling is is very high for him at left tackle. Um, I think the the one the biggest uh, um, demerit for the offensive line would have been <laughs> blocking on the quarterback sneak. Um, I I don't know how much quarterback sneaks we'll see moving forward. I don't think that is necessarily a strength for Zeke Carell at center or Drew Pine at quarterback. So that was something that uh, was lacking in terms of the offensive line play against North Carolina. But that. Um, that's sport sort of speaks to how well the line play when we have to nitpick t- to that little bit of a level to find um, some mistakes within a unit that played its best game of the season. And there are people that could argue, Hey, why don't you put Steve Angeli who's six foot three, two ten or two twenty, in for that play. But then you're really telegraphing what you're doing. You're also begging for probably a bad exchange on that sneak too. the fact that that would be his first snap. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, the quarterback sneak, even with Audric Estime pushing from behind was not, uh, well executed going back to Joe all, you know, again, we go back to the pro football focus grades. He's by far, by far Notre Dame's best player, according to pro football focus and playing at a level that would put him on their all America teams, um, run blocking and pass blocking. Uh, he gets excellent grades, and so uh, it's it's really interesting to see him evolve into such a um, standout player. Given the fact that he was a three star recruit, so was Jarrett Patterson, and and those guys are both on NFL trajectories right now. What about Zeke Carell? Um, from a grade standpoint, he was steadily improving from the Ohio State grade. He had gotten a better grade against Marshall much better grade against Cal at his best game then went backwards a little bit in terms of his grade. I, I wrote 
a feature about Zeke Perel today. What's kind of your impression of what Zeke's giving them at center and what that could turn into over the balance of the season? Yeah, I didn't – the the low grade was a bit surprising to me. I didn't think he played poorly against, against North Carolina, and uh, I, I don't – that's the thing with the PFF grades. You don't know. You don't always know exactly what they're getting graded so poorly for, um, or positive, or in the reverse. What are they getting graded so highly for? Um, although sometimes that can be a little bit more obvious because he, success is, is usually pretty easy to see. Right. So I, I, I think he's. I think he's done a good job. I think that um, he's settling into the position. I think he's getting comfortable with the guards next to him and having the same guards next to him. And Jared Patterson and Josh Lug is beneficial. And I think uh, certainly I, I don't know. He, he's an interesting player because I, I don't you don't think of him as someone that's going to be blowing up nose guards and, and getting them off the line of scrimmage. But I think sometimes he plays better with that challenge in front of him than sort of working up to the next level, which isn't necessarily what you would think because he's he's a, a smaller guy. He's pretty nimble, um, right. so you would think it would sort of be the other way around. But I but I think he's done a pretty solid job at sort of moving guys and helping move guys um, from the interior. So I, I thought they did a good job. They were able to run the ball up the middle a number of times against North Carolina. So I thought the PFF grade was a little bit uh, perplexing to me. So I, I think I, I give Zeke Carell my uh, TJ grade uh, a thumbs up for, for his performance against North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Eric? Yeah, well, I know, too, uh, we've had Aaron Taylor on the podcast before, and Aaron is critical of the PFF offensive line grades. Aaron has his own grading system, and uh, I have not had a chance to talk to him. We hope to have him on the podcast at some point here, not too far down the line, just to get his thoughts on how Notre Dame's progressing as a unit. Um, Zeke Carell uh, is an intriguing guy because if Notre Dame's offensive line is going to be elite, he's going to be a sidebar to that. He's going to be, we're going to be talking about how he got beat out last year at offensive guard and how he kind of withstood early criticism and turned out to be a better than average setter. And I think that's all he has to be is a better than average center with everybody that's around him. Um, he he's an interesting guy. He went from 295 last year to 308 in the um by the time training camp started. He mentioned the other day that he's down to 300, and it's not because he doesn't eat. He tries to eat <laughs> constantly. It's because he is a serial sweater, meaning he sweats constantly throughout the day which there's got to be an nil for that somewhere an nil deal for him like moisture wicking you know sweatshirts or something like that but uh he said it gets to the point where he's even had to take ivs he sweats so much and loses so much uh fluid from perspiration so uh but he he's one of those people that can eat what he wants and not gain a pound which that doesn't happen in my world but uh uh, he is, um, I think, a, certainly a guy with a lot of resolve. I mean, when he got beat out last year, he could have transferred, he could have pouted, and instead he forced his way back into the top five, which I give him a lot of credit. Maybe that's from being the youngest of nine children and having to fight for everything with eight older siblings, <laughs> including four brothers. So Zeke Carell certainly a guy to watch as we move forward. Uh, did you did you have a sense of how Jarrett Patterson played as he continues to recover from that foot injury in mid August? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I'm curious. I, I would love to know in an honest moment, like how how he's truly feeling. I don't know that he's 100, well, um, but I think he's playing well. I think he's getting the job done. I, I think. Um, He's probably not moving as well as he'd like to, um, but I think he's he's getting the job done. He's he's creating movement in terms of getting guys off the line of scrimmage, and I think his leadership and, and communication is something that's certainly valued on the offensive line. So I, I think he's doing a nice job. I don't know that he's quite playing at the preseason All-American level that he could have if he didn't suffer the preseason 
foot injury, but I, I think he's he's done a, a nice job working his way back in there. He's someone I'm sure that was probably happy for the bye week, get his get some more rest for that foot, and hopefully uh, can feel even even better moving forward. Okay, well, again, a reminder, we're taking your questions, so put them in the chat box, and uh, we'll get to those a little bit later in the show. Now we're going to ask Tyler another question. Players who surprised in the game, who surprised you uh, in the North Carolina game Saturday? Yeah, we've, we've touched on both of them a little bit, but I'll highlight them again. Logan Diggs was someone who surprised me. I one that I wasn't necessarily sure that they could find a role for all three running backs, even when we had asked Tommy Reese about that. Um, and sort of when we were trying to figure out, okay, why isn't Chris Tyree more involved? He sort of expressed how, how it was difficult to get all three running backs involved. And then when he missed the game against Cal and, and, and uh, Chris Tyree and Audrey Estime had so much success, it's like, man, is, is Logan Diggs going to be sort of the guy left behind here? And that didn't seem to be the case. And I thought he did a pretty good job of playing when at and doing all the different things that they were asking of him. I, I, and even when, even when he ha- and I, and I don't know how much it was related to still being a little bit uncertain with his shoulder, but I, I wasn't necessarily particularly impressed with the way he played in the first two games. So um, I think Logan Diggs looked sort of like the Logan Diggs we saw him in flashes at the end of last season. And so that was a good thing to see from Notre Dame's offense. And then defensively, Jack Kaiser was someone who was surprised. We, we sort of highlighted that he did a really good job playing inside linebacker. And I think for the most part made the absence of J.D. Bertrand um, less noticeable with the way he was playing um, at inside linebacker. So those are the two guys I thought um, played well and I would say surprised to some extent. Okay. Let's move on to questions lingering. What four games into the season do we not know about this Notre Dame team or maybe are concerned regarding this Notre Dame team on a two-game winning streak? Yeah, I think, I mean, first off, when we're talking about the season and what this team could be (laughs) and seeing what they did against North Carolina, it's like, well, okay, how, how much of that is because of how inept North Carolina was it is will all of those things that worked against North Carolina be, be replicable? Will they be, th- are there wrinkles that Notre Dame has found within its offense that it can sort of rely on from a weekly basis rather than um, count on using them against a defense that <laughs> couldn't seem to get out of its own way or do things right. Um, so I, I still think, there are plenty of questions lingering about the offense moving forward. I think the number one question is, can the wide receivers get more involved? Um, my, my sense is no, uh, just based off of what we've seen, but I, m- maybe there are different ways to get them involved that, that they can. And uh, But I think, I think you're sort of limited when you're talking about trying to use different parts of the field. If you're going to use the running backs and the tight ends as much as you, you – Notre Dame has and and Notre Dame has had success with okay what what parts of the field can the, the wide receivers exploit and it seems like if, if the tight ends and running backs are taking in up that the, sh- the shorter yardage passing then you're going to try to get the wide receivers open downfield and I don't know how many can do that and if that's what's best for the offense trying to do that consistently so I think I don't know that that question is ever going to not <laughs> linger uh, in terms of what, how how much the wide receivers can can provide for this offense, but that that's, that's the biggest question still lingering in my mind. Um, what about you, Eric? Um, my, my biggest question, uh, let me, let me address what you said about the wide receivers and then I'll get to my answer. Um, I want, I want to follow up. If Colsey Wilkins and Tobias are healthy, not in a doghouse, not, having inconsistent practices, let's say they're all at their optimum. Does that change the wide receiver equation for you? Does that, do their skill sets open up some different possibilities given the fact that they are all kind of bigger receivers and, and have different strengths? You know, you got a six, five kid with Tobias, you got a six, four kid with Colsey and then a six, two kid with Wilkins, who's a really good run blocker and hasn't 
shown the flashes in games that his coaches and teammates seem to think that he shows in practice or has shown in the past. Yeah, I mean, certainly if Tobias Merriweather is doing everything that's asked of him, if he's going in motion when being told to go in motion, lining up where he's supposed to line up and and has the command of the routes that's being asked of him to run, I think he can be a bit of a vertical threat for Notre Dame, and it's it's going to be easier to hit Tobias Merriweather on a vertical threat than even Lorenzo Styles, even if Lorenzo Styles is good at that. But the size difference just makes him a bigger target and easier for for Drew Pine to hit him and have more confidence in hitting him. So that would be one way that I think you could see a, a bit difference. And I think with the way Notre Dame's offense has operated, if you can rely on whether it's Deion Colsey or Joe Wilkins or any receiver to sort of be reliable in one-on-one situations on the outside, I still like I I I I want to see Drew Pine's ability to sort of deliver those throws with consistency. And so I think that that it's sort of twofold there that you have to have guys that you trust from the wide receiver position, but you have to be able to trust Drew Pine to do that um, on a consistent basis and put the ball in position that's, that's not able to get intercepted, that guys can't jump routes um, against those guys in coverage. So I think Notre Dame's probably going to see a lot of t- tight coverage on the outside because there aren't a lot of guys that have proven that they can create separation. And then that's really creates difficult throws for, for Drew Pine and trying to get those guys the ball. Okay. So my question lingering really centers on Drew Pine because I was pretty impressed with what he did in the North Carolina game. I also understand the context of North North Carolina, not being a very good defensive team. Notre Dame doesn't see a lot of good pass defenses for, for a while um, they, toward the end of the season that they, they will. Um, they'll see some very good run defenses at the end of October, early November, when they get into Syracuse and Clemson into that stretch. Navy, oddly, is one of the better uh, run defenses in the country, but uh, people are throwing the ball all over the place on them. Uh, so, so what's Drew Pine going to look like when teams start to scout him a little bit heavier, uh, try to take some of the favorite things that he does away from him. Is he going to have, and he and Tommy Reese, I should say, are they going to have a counter move to, to those adjustments and so forth? That's what I'm kind of wondering. Is he going to be somebody that can win some of the games that we thought only Tyler Buckner was capable of winning earlier, at least, I thought only Tyler Buckner. I had this team initially going 10 and 2. Uh when Tyler Buckner went down for the season, I did not think 10 and 2 was possible. Uh I'm open to changing my mind on that after I see the BYU game. I really wanted to see how Drew Pine and the rest of the team played in in a road game against North Carolina, a neutral site game against a BYU team that's ranked 19th in the country. So what are your thoughts on, I I know I asked you a little bit earlier, but do you think people are, what do you think maybe defensive coordinators are going to try to do to make life harder for Drew Pine? Well, I, I, that's a good question. I, I think probably try to throw as many different looks as, as you can at, at Notre Dame, Um, try to confuse him as much as you can in terms of whether they're playing man defense, zone defense, do different things. Because I think taking away some of those short games can, can um, you can do that a number of different ways um, in terms of playing playing man or playing zone um, and, and bringing different looks. I I, I would try to uh, blitz him and get him uncomfortable and put pressure on him. I mean, I, obviously you want to do that with any quarterback, but I, I don't think that's necessarily Drew Pine's Pine's strength. He is fine, I think, on designed like rollouts and when he has time to set his feet. But he, he seemed, I have not been very impressed with like him throwing on the run when he's like literally rolling out and moving and then throwing while he's doing that rather than like, okay, we're going to move the pocket and get him in a different position, set and throw. I don't think he's, he's shown a very good um, ability to throw on the run. And I think that comes back to his arm strength deficiency. Um, and so I would try to make him do that and get him out of the 
get him out of the pocket, chase him um, as much as you can. Um, and then also, I mean, like I said, pl- play, play close coverage. I would, I mean, play single high safety. That's um, Notre Dame seemed to not be willing to take some shots down the field because that's what uh, Cal was doing. At least that's what they seem to, um, at least what Tommy Reese was trying to explain to us, if I understood that correctly. Um, so I think that maybe that's what we see more of moving forward and just make make Notre Dame do that consistently because some of those throws that Drew Pine didn't make were a lot easier than they can be just because of the, the lack of good coverage from North Carolina. Okay, well, we're going to go to questions now because we're running short on time and I'm tired of hearing Tyler talk. <laughs> about his opinion so let's let's uh answer we want to your get your questions. opinions we need to yeah. get your opinions in the mix that's right all right let me let me start here with jack quinn um first he says ha- he had no idea that eric was so smart a lot of degrees behind him and i uh, spoiler alert those aren't those aren't all degrees but they are good things uh for uh, so the question is what wrinkles would you like to see Andy add during the buy um and then another uh question is is there a direct snap guy that could bring in now a la Bucker in 2021. Um, yeah, those are um being a judge in the chili cookoffs. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh uh wrinkles during the bye. I, I think what I would like to see Notre Dame is just getting better at some of the things that we've seen progress at um with the multiple tight ends look, getting those younger tight ends more involved. Uh, seeing what Tobias Merriweather and some of the receivers that haven't played a lot, see what they could do. Um, just refining Notre Dame's run defense, uh, getting the back end of the defense better. And also, I would I, I would like to see Notre Dame's pressures be more effective. There, it wasn't so much a problem in the North Carolina game as it was earlier in the season, but there were times Notre Dame would blitz, and we're not going to talk about the ones in Ohio State, but they just didn't didn't get home. You know, it was that they would get picked up, and then there would be a hole in the defense, and and Notre Dame needs to be a better third down team on on defense. So we haven't seen that. As far as a direct snap guy, boy, if Avery Davis were healthy, wouldn't that be nice? Right. Um, I would say out of Diggs. Chris Tyree and Audric, I would say probably Diggs would be the guy that would operate that the best. I think he sees the field the best out of those three. He's a little bit bigger than Chris Tyree, so he could probably power his way out of trouble a little bit. I don't know if any of those guys can throw the ball in a pinch, <laughs> but um, Diggs to me seems like like the guy. Audric just would, I think. Um, want to run quarterback sneaks every down what what do you think tyler <laughs> well that is a wrinkle i'm not interested in seeing i yeah i don't i, I don't i don't want them that to be a, a wrinkle in the offense i think playing two running backs together uh, alongside pine can sort of bring that benefit of having a, a running quarterback because you have two different running options great really uh running threats back there because drew pine isn't necessarily a running threat he can pick up some yards but he's not gonna run away from a lot of people um, in terms of wrinkles, I would like to see added during the buy. I would probably, I mean, it, it sort of comes back to the receivers. How, how can they get those guys more involved? What what sort of aspects of the passing game can they sort of highlight and add to to create some more opportunities for different receivers? And then I think it also makes the job of the other guys easier if those other receivers are threats. So I, I don't. I don't necessarily have like a, a list of plays that I would be handing over to Tommy Reese to say, Hey, try these. Uh, but I, I would like to do that. And I also, I think I, I want to see, and I think we need to see if, if these uh, younger tight ends are playing more, those guys do use in the passing game to some extent, because they haven't really been uh, asked to do that, which I think there is confidence in them as receivers. I think we think they're pretty good at that, but they haven't. I was sort of waiting during the North Carolina game. One of those times to, when they're in two or three tight end sets for Eli Reardon to just sort of leak out um, and, and get him the football, but they, they haven't necessarily done that yet. All right, let's find another question here. 
I think uh, let's go to Chris Fleck. Speaking of NIL, I'm of the opinion ND should put the players' names back on their jerseys permanently. Thought the green out jersey is a teaser. Your thoughts? Um, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, you know, wouldn't prioritize it at this point. Uh, but uh, I, I'm okay with the jerseys being on the back with NIL and everything else. I think that is a small step toward, you know, getting an identifier, building a brand for the player. So uh, I, I have no no issues with that. How about you, Tyler? Yeah, I, just, I mean, I want to, I want Tyler to have the name, his name on the back of his shirt when he's covering a game. <laughs> what you don't know is I wear an undershirt that says James on it at all times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, I'm okay with it. I don't really have a strong preference either way. I don't, I don't think you don't see the guys. I, I don't know. I, Maybe it's the way I watch football, but I don't associate. Okay, I, I know who that is because I saw the guy's name on the back of his jersey during a game. Like that doesn't necessarily. I mean, you 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 sort of figure the announcers say their names. Um, so unless you're not unless you're watching the game on mute, um, then 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 maybe you're not sure or you don't have a roster handy. You can't figure it out. So I don't know that that would make a huge difference in the NIL space. And, and as we've seen, that Notre Dame is uh, there is. Uh, a deal with, I believe, fanat fanatics to sell some players' jerseys as long as they've given permission um, uh, with with the names on them. So I don't it, whether or not Notre Dame wears them on the field or not. I don't know if that would impact the sales or not. If they, maybe people would be more willing to buy them if those are the actual ones that they wear um, on the field because they don't actually wear the names on them. But um, it's a question that we've been uh, asked a number of times here in the last few weeks. Uh, get a question here from Four Wombly's that I don't know that we have a great answer to, but let's let's uh, let's throw it out there. Why does Notre Dame not allow the beat to upload full videos from press conferences while being so slow to upload clips themselves? We, I think I have somewhat of an answer to that because uh, we got ambushed by that policy several years ago. At the beginning of training camp, it was kind of explained to us in the parking lot down at Culver what, what was going on. And I think what Notre Dame did is kind of take a page out of the NFL's book um, in that they want to drive their fans to their content, not our content. So uh, they they feel like this is a way for them to monetize things and also kind of control the message a little bit more. Uh, so limiting outlets from, from using that content um, is their way of directing that. So anyways, all I know is it made a lot of people in our business mad. There was a lot of shouting and uh, going on. And I think that, that the actual three minute thing became, like a compromise. I think they weren't going to allow any of it. What Tyler, what's your recollection? Cause I know you were one of the people that were mad. Um, I don't remember all of it. I, I know one of the things that was the most ridiculous in my mind is that we couldn't, that they were asking that we not advertise on any content that, that was cre video created. That was content based around. Yeah. Under it. I was like, well, that <laughs> we already had a contract in place. Yeah. I was like, you, you can't tell us that. Like that's, that's not, that doesn't yeah. make any sense. So, I mean, I think some of it was related to Notre Dame being able to profit off of its own uh, content rather than than others doing that. I don't know that that's necessarily a, a correlated to what is being asked here in terms of why the videos aren't uploaded as quickly. I mean, I don't know how many people know how the various press conferences are, are operated um, throughout the week at Notre Dame. Marcus Freeman's press conference on Monday – I believe now don't don't quote me on all of this because I, we're participating in the press conference so I don't really know how it's being presented elsewhere always but I believe that is carried live on YouTube um, on Mondays on Tuesdays when we talk to players and coaches it, it, it's split up where upstairs in the indoor facility the print writers speak with them off camera um, and then folks that want to do video can ask folk the the players or the coaches questions on video now that stuff is not carried live um 
my guess is they probably Notre Dame isn't necessarily wanting to carry players live. I think it's just a little bit more high risk and puts those more pressure on those guys to have their press conferences stream live when the players are talking. But I don't know. I've never really asked someone that. That's more of an assumption on my part. Um, and then Thursday we do a press conference on Zoom. Um, I don't think that is carried live, and I don't know how quickly that's put up. Um, so I do. So like after the games, I think road games is probably pretty hard for them to get the videos up right away because they're 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 being hustled to get on on the plane to get back uh, into town because the, they right. fly out the night of the game. So I don't know if that's a part of the issues, but. Um, just more reason to tune into uh, to our websites, InsideNDSports.com, the Insider Lounge. We post transcripts. Um, we we post updates during the press conferences. Um, so we try to keep everyone uh, clued into what's being said and what's going on. Next question is from Nathan Kolda. To the point about using all three running backs. Excuse me. How does that actually work? Is Tommy calling down and directing who's going in and coming out on every play, or is it all package based? You know what? I'm I'm guessing a little bit here um, just from the conversations that we've had with Tommy Reese and things that Marcus Freeman has said. I think running backs coach Dylan McCullough has a big part in who's in the game at different times, how much they're going to use people. I would think it's package based um, in terms of what Tommy's going to call. Uh, like if Audric's in the game versus Chris Tyree, I think the play calls aren't all the same there, but I do think Dylan McCullough has input into how much each of those guys are playing. Tyler, what's your sense of that? Yeah. I, I don't think on a play to play basis, Tommy is the one directing who is on the field. Um, I think that comes down to the running back coach and Dylan McCullough. So, and he's downstairs, by and, the way. Yeah. And he's, he's on the field and he's, he's communicating with those guys and making sure the guy, right guys are in. I mean, and so, sometimes rotations are based on play calls. Sometimes they're based on if someone's tired. So um, obviously Tommy Reese is a play caller needs to know who is in there. So he has to be a, sort of on the same page with Dylan and he can communicate, Hey, I'd like to, I'd like to run this play for Chris Tyree. So let's make sure he's in there on third down or um, stuff like that. So I think it's, it's not necessarily done. Um, there's different ways to do it. And, and I, I don't know that it's always done this, the same way every time. Um, but I, I, there has to be a lot of communication there to make sure that those guys are in those right positions. And um, it can't be like, hey, we need two running backs out there. It doesn't matter which two out, are out there. Sometimes it, um, there are things put in throughout the week that um, can be best be executed by specific running backs, and so they'll make sure that that is how they are, they're used. Uh, all right, I think we got one more question from Roger Lancey. Do you think that Notre Dame should try a long – Pass, I think, is what the word that's missing there. Long pass at least once a game just to keep the safeties honest. Put the freshman in just to run a go route should be easy to learn. Well, I think if you don't have some of that in your repertoire, you're going to see teams cheat their safeties up. If they don't think that you are a threat to do that, they will not play honestly. And as you get to play the better defenses, it'll be a problem. Your, your shorter and middle pass games will be more congested because the safeties will play up. Um, so yes, I, I do think you have to convince teams that, you know, that, that, that there is that threat. And if it's there, go ahead and take it. I remember um, a pit Notre Dame game years ago when Will, Will Fuller had one-on-one -on -one coverage Every play, they were they were bound to determine that they were not going to give safety help to Will Fuller, and I, I think he might have had four or five touchdowns in that pit game. And Pat Narduzzi was just defending that in his post game press conference. So that's a little bit of the reverse of what can happen if teams don't respect your deep passing game, and you have somebody like Will Fuller on your team, just go ahead and continue to use them. But uh, I do think you have to have all those things in your offense. The more versatile your offense is, the more difficult it is for a defensive coordinator to game plan against it. Right. Yeah. It's a little bit more predictable if you just have a guy coming in and doing the same thing 
once a game or, or, or even twice a game. But I, I do think that they do need to take those shots. Um, and it has to be something that even if it's not successful can benefit the offense. Now you have to pick the right positions to do that in. I think when your offense is more successful, you can do that because it doesn't hurt you to just have an incomplete pass on first and 10 or second and 10 because you're confident you can second and two or or, yeah. Or second and two. Um, Yeah. I mean, that's the ideal time to do it because you're, you're saying, well, we we can pick up two yards on third down. So let's go ahead and take a shot here. Um, But if, if you're extremely confident in your offense, you can sort of do that in any down and distance because you're not afraid of what you're limited to do or what you, what you can do on the the remaining down. So um, I think for instance, like um, I think about, I think it was the second deeper throw of the game um, for North Carolina, which was to JJ Jones. And he caught it over Jaden Mickey down like the left sideline going into the end zone, ended up setting up Josh Downs, second touchdown catch. That was a third and three play call. And I, 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 my guess is North Carolina decided that it was going to go for it on fourth down. So they didn't, they were willing to take that shot on third down. Um, and that they, they threw it much farther than the three yards, the three yards they needed on that third down. So um, when you could do that against a defense, because you're confident in what your offense can do. Now, obviously North Carolina has a lot more confidence in its ability to stretch the field uh, with its playmakers downfield and with its quarterback than Notre Dame is, but I, I still think Notre Dame has to continue to push and create those opportunities and, and create those shots because some of them will work. They're not going to go zero for twenty on those. Like they will get one, and if one doesn't, if they don't all work. You might get a pass interference too. That's fifteen free yards if you can get guys open. So um, and force the defense to to sort of panic and, and interfere. Um, the most important part is to not throw an interception. Now, it's not the end of the world if you throw a deep interception as long as you tackle them pretty soon after that because sometimes <laughs> it's almost the equivalent of a punt. But um, I think uh, that is something that Notre Dame needs to incorporate it in its offense to sort of maximize and raise the potential for this offense. All right, Eric, I think uh, that, 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 that wraps it up for our Monday night live show. We had lots of um, good interaction from our commenters and, and, and observers. We appreciate that. Thanks to everyone who tuned in live. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed to us so you can receive a reminder for future shows. I think we're going to skip next Monday. I don't know that Eric and I have totally talked about that. Um, but we'll, if, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll t- telepathically <laughs> done it, <laughs> uh, because since there's no game this Saturday, there's not, there won't necessarily be more for us to react to next Monday. So the next time you'll, you'll likely see us on YouTube will be, um, the following week on our, in our place, your bets preview of the, of the BYU game. Um, but you can certainly hear us on our weekly inside ND sports podcast. We'll have one this week and next, and we'll have plenty of written coverage coming your way on inside and don't forget to hit the like button. And also, don't be shy about asking questions. We won't um, correct your grammar or your spelling. Um, but I may mess up your name. That's the only thing that we can guarantee. <laughs>